All right, let's see if that's, that should be unmuted. All right, welcome everyone. Our speaker today is Dr. Christopher Moore from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Uh, Chris received his PhD from the University of Colorado Boulder in 2017, uh, where he won a number of awards and honors, including the NASA Space Technology Research Fellowship and Mission of the Year for the miniature X-ray spectrometer CubeSat that he worked on, that I think we'll hear a little bit about today. Um, after his PhD, Chris went on to be a postdoctoral fellow at the CFA, uh, where he's now a research associate. Um, so we're going to hear today about X-ray measurements of the sun uh, using these really exciting lower cost instruments like CubeSats and sounding rockets. So take it away, Chris. Is that good enough? Thank you, Marin. I appreciate the introduction and I appreciate you all inviting me to come out and speak with you today. So I know there's a long title here, but basically we're gonna probe the solar atmosphere with soft X-rays to analyze the hot plasma in the atmosphere, what I like to call a cool star. And this video here is a composite of multi-extreme ultraviolet filter images. And you can see that the solar atmosphere is highly dynamic, highly variable, it's non-homogeneous in the spatial radiative properties. And it's one of the, my favorite stars. <clears throat> and it's, Pretty cool to me, hence the cool star. So for this talk today, I will give a brief overview of the solar atmosphere. I'll talk specifically about the solar corona. I'll talk about X-ray diagnostics that we use via the miniature X-ray solar spectrometer and dual aperture X-ray solar spectrometer CubeSats. And I'll talk about future small sat and sounding rocket mission opportunities to expand upon what's already been done with those first two CubeSats that I've mentioned. The research program that we have going on at the Center for Astrophysics encompasses numerous aspects of broad themes, technology development, for example, detectors here on the left, instrumentation, CubeSat, small sats, and rockets. I'll talk about some of these today. Data analysis and modeling of stellar atmospheres, not just the sun, and specifically numerical simulations of the solar corona. You all are astronomers here, so I won't spend too much time on this introduction. But essentially here we have the hertzsprung russell diagram. It has the intensity of the photospheric emission from stars in the vertical axis. And the horizontal axis is the photospheric surface temperature. The sun is located here in the lower end, the cooler end of the temperature spectrum. Hence, we call it a cool star. But it's cool in multiple ways. Cool in temperature and also I think it's cool as what the video you saw earlier. It's highly dynamic atmosphere. And so quick summary, heat transfer in stars, the sun is here in the middle. It's, it's range such that in this outer envelope is convective, while lower mass stars is, are fully convective, which has huge magnetic field ramifications in its atmosphere, while higher mass stars have a radiative outer envelope. And so one of the benefits of the sun being so close to us, it allows us to study it in great spatial detail which is not necessarily accessible for other stars. And this is readily apparent when you look at the sun in visible light, particularly in this particular example, 450 nanometer continuum light, it looks pretty boring, right? You're staring at the sun. I don't see much going on here. I see some sensor to limb brightening effects here or darkening effects. I see a sunspot where convection is actually inhibited. So it's actually emission coming there. It's just less emission than the rest of the sun. And if we stare at this patch in the center, which looks like nothing's happening, but when we zoom in, for example, with the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope based on the mountain in Haleakala, Maui, Hawaii, we see this. It's a convection. Most of us here are familiar with this phenomena. It's radiation transport by fluid motions. You have the hot plasma rising up. And in the instance for the solar photosphere, the opacity changes drastically such that visible light photons are allowed to freely stream around to this earth and further. Basically, the mean free path is extended as the opacity drops. So that cools the local plasma and it does fall back down in these dark downflow lanes, intergranular lanes, which we see here. So we have the bright convective upwells, which are emitting a lot of radiation, higher temperature. We have the cool downflow lanes, which we also call intergranular lanes. And if we look in this region, we see these little bright features within the intergranular lanes. These are kilogauss magnetic flux tubes that are aligned essentially vertically. 
So the dominant magnetic component is aligned vertically. Now, everywhere else you see here, and this is part of my master's thesis, there actually are local dynamo effects. So there's horizontal magnetic field here. And if you were actually to analyze it in a broader spatial extent here, you would get a net zero magnetic component, which there is a lot of total magnetic field there, but vector magnetic field is almost zero here. Here it's vertical. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that's happening, but one can see that the magnetic field structures are being invected around by the fluid flows. And because there is stronger magnetic field here, the opacity is lower. You see deeper down into the solar atmosphere in these local regions where the source function for radiative loss is stronger, hence they appear brighter in this wavelength, which is visible light. So solar pho so photosphere, it's a cool star, but what happens in the outer atmosphere and what could be driving energy transportation from the lower atmosphere to the higher atmosphere? where well, there are many theories for this. I just talked to you about the random walk that the, it happens in the intragranular lanes with these Kilogauss flux tubes. And as we move higher up in altitude in the solar atmosphere, the pressure drops. So these magnetic flux is fairly constant, so it expands out. But like I mentioned before, they're vectored around by fluid flows, have this random motion. And so that brings into some different physical phenomena that we can investigate. So one paradigm is essentially, or um, parameter we can look at is the time it takes for these, these Kilogauss flux tubes to move across the solar photosphere. If the time is relatively short, basically shorter than alpha and wave crossing time, we would expect some of the oscillations to propagate up into the solar atmosphere. There are current models that predict that we would anticipate temperatures in the corona between one to three mega Kelvin during quiescent times. These are times where there are not large eruptions occurring, which I will talk about later, we call these eruptions solar flares. If the time scale is relatively long, it allows time for these kilogauss flux tubes to entangle themselves, braid, twist, build currents, and eventually release this energy via instabilities of the magnetic field. We call this magnetic reconnection, rearrangement of the magnetic field, which can accelerate particles outwards into space, into the solar atmosphere simultaneously. The large eruptions are called solar flares. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about very, very, very small spatial scales Time scales on the orders of a few minutes to tens of minutes here, while sub minutes here. But these are, I believe, to occur down to the smaller spatial scales, releasing nano energy size eruptions, hence the term nano flare. Now, we don't necessarily know if nano flares persist ubiquitously across the solar atmosphere in the corona, but models predict if this were the case, we'd expect to see hot, copious, very dim plasma around five mega Kelvin and greater. I'll talk about this a little bit more later. So as I mentioned before, in the photosphere, the temperature is about five to 6,000 degrees Kelvin. There's a drop to a solar minimum in the photosphere, but as we move high, higher and higher altitudes, again here in the horizontal axis, the temperature takes off. I just talked about two mechanisms for transporting energy. The question though, for solar coronal heating and heating in all low mass stars is how is this energy dissipated to the small scales? That's not what we're gonna address here, but that's the big Nobel prize winning question to be answered. And in the corona, we see we're above a million degrees Kelvin as the density diminishes drastically. So if we look at the sun in different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, looking at different ions and ionization states, filter images in extreme ultraviolet light and x-rays here, we see different physical features. Um, here in 6,000 degrees, you see sunspots. Not all active region, which I'll, this is a term that I just introduced now, but I'll discuss more in detail later. That's these bright features, but not all active regions are co-spatial with sunspots, those dark features that appear here. So I think this makes the sun really cool. So sun is viewed as a boring star, but one can say literally, if you just look at different wavelengths, the features are very, very different as we go and probe higher and higher temperature plasma. So it's very clear that even though the sun as a surface appears as a very boring dull star, it actually has a lot of uniqueness to it. And this is just the sun. So think about what's going on with other types of stars. And the sun is spatial, has a lot of spatial variability. So it's pretty important. And spectra is important to probing this in the photosphere and the outer atmosphere. 
This is driven by the magnetic field structure, the plasma density changes as a function of altitude and along equal optical depth surfaces, so similar altitudes, and temperature that drives a lot of this spatial variability. So I'll introduce a term here called plasma beta. Many of you are pretty sure are familiar with it. It's the ratio of the gas pressure to the magnetic pressure locally. And for higher temperature plasmas, as we see here on this table, in the photosphere, we're about 6,000 degrees Kelvin. For a quiescent sun, you can get almost three, uh, three orders of magnitude higher temperatures. But the dominant change, it actually comes from the density. As one moves higher in the atmosphere, the density drops off by over eight orders of magnitude. And the magnetic field can increase by about a factor of 50. And this is also non-homogeneous across the sun, which I'll show you in a second. So on our horizontal axis, we have plasma beta here. On the vertical axis is height. So in the photosphere, as you saw, the plasma beta is greater than unity. Gas pressure dominates, as you saw with the kilogauss flux tubes, they're vectored around by fluid flows. Now this is not necessarily the case in sunspots where we have much, much stronger magnetic fields, structures. But as we go higher in the atmosphere, we drop in plasma beta. And now those are the features that you saw in the corona where the plasma is essentially frozen in because it's pr primarily ionized. So it will follow the large scale magnetic field structures. This is readily apparent with the dipole magnetic field, but also with the smaller scale magnetic field, which I'll highlight in a few slides. And I don't know about all of you here, but in 2017, I had a great opportunity to see the solar eclipse in totality in Wyoming. I was a grad student at Colorado at the time, so I was leading a exhibition to go talk with tourists and show them this total solar eclipse. And it was mind blowing for me and it, reaffirmed why I think the solar corona is cool. As you see here, you can see these large scale features, brightness, and you see these streams coming out at the North and South Poles. And there's this basically diffuse emission around there in visible light, that scattered light from the photosphere. So did anyone here get the chance to see the solar eclipse in totality? We have a few. It was cool, wasn't it? It's only about five minutes long. But it's five minutes you will never forget. <laughs> so a stagnant, processed, highly processed image of the solar eclipse, it's very apparent to see the free electrons that are confined to the large scale dipolar magnetic field, and also this diffuse emission or reflected light from the photosphere that you see here coming from dust and other particles that are in the solar atmosphere. And so the corona, the plasma temperature is greater than 500,000 Kelvin. Densities are much lower than the photosphere. Origin of many different electromagnetic phenomena and instabilities that we'll talk about throughout this talk. And that's invisible light. So in x-rays, the sun looks very different. And on the left here, we see, even though there aren't um, many eruptions occurring, there is still a non-homogeneous distribution of X-ray emission, where there are bright points, there are dark regions, and there's this, this diffuse cone, essentially, all around the sun. Now, this intensity also changes as a function of time throughout the solar magnetic cycle. And we can see more of these brighter concentrations, which are basically, again, uh, magnetic field, perturbing through the atmosphere up until the corona, confining plasma, which is cooling radiatively in soft x-rays. This is the 11 year solar magnetic cycle. Sunspots pop up um, from min to max for five to six years, and then go back to a minimum again in 11 years. There's also a 22 year magnetic cycle with a polarity, the global polarity flips. So now north goes to south, south goes to north. And here we see plasma in the quiescent sun, about one to two megakelvin. There's the energy flux. Um, the energy flux in these active regions are at least around two orders of magnitude greater. Plasma temperature is much higher than two megakelvin. And so like I mentioned before, radiative cooling is happening. So uh, here I have on the left, the radiative loss function. And on the vertical axis is ergs per centimeter per second. The horizontal axis is temperature. The dominant uh, mission mechanisms, because this is optically then plasma, so the plasma is transparent to its own radiation. It's primarily driven by collisions of free electrons with the ions, and then they either spontaneously decay after being excited to a higher energy state, 
they recombine with the ions, or there's also free, free emission where the electron loses its energy and emits a photon. On the right, we see synthetic spectra in soft X-rays. And as the temperature increases here vertically, you know, we're about three to five million degrees now, one can see the drastic change in the amount of photon flux above one kV as we go to higher and higher temperatures. So this free-free Bremsstrahlung emission dominates the spectral shape, this continuum. There is additional continuum from radiative recombination and superimposed on top of that are the spectral lines from spontaneous emission. These are driven by iron, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, and oxygen for temperatures present in the corona. This transitions to hydrogen and helium dominating the free-free emission as the majority of these elements are fully ionized at temperatures in excess of about 20 million degrees, which happens during solar flares. So if we have a question. Yeah, it's, you showed images just of, oh, sorry. Um, so we have a question in the audience for those of you that are so, on Zoom. Thank you. Uh, it's just a dumb question because I can't remember. You showed a couple of pictures in x-rays of the sun. You said they were soft x-rays. And I'm assuming that's still less than one keV. Like with the, these images here, is it half a keV? Roughly? So these are from the Hanode x- So the question, can I hear on Zoom? Okay. So these images, thank you for asking this question, are from the Hanode x-ray telescope. They are spectrally integrated filter images and the band passes very for the different filter types, but for the image here, it's roughly 0 0.2 keV to 2 keV. Oh, all the way to two. All the way to two. Sorry. There are other filters which constrain that okay. band pass, but for this particular one, um, it's pretty broad. And that's actually an issue. Now the spatial distribution is nice to see, um, but if we have spectral distribution with the spatial distribution, there's immense amount of information there powerful diagnostic capability. So thank you for highlighting that. I'll get to that later. Are there any other questions as of right now? Thank you. You're welcome. So soft X-ray spectra are extremely important and sensitive to plasma temperature and elemental abundance variations. So more soft X-ray spectrally resolved measurements uh, give us much more information than just spectral the integrated, spatially separated data. And that brings us to the next point. What is a soft X-ray spectral distribution and how does it vary for different physical phenomena like the quiet sun, active regions and solar flares, as we've learned that it has copious amounts of information. Now I'll cut through the details for you all and just say we've had numerous soft X-ray measurements for, since the 1970s for the sun. But from the time frame of 1970s to around 2008, they, we've lacked broadband spectrally resolved measurements. We've had very narrow spectral range. So the spectral range is on the vertical axis. So we've had SMM, Bragg crystal spectrometers, uh, mostly um, that give us this very narrow spectral range, but very high spectral resolution. But <clears throat> it's good to get all of it at once. So XSM Tranjayan from India, Kronos Photon Sphinx, it's a Polish mission. They had pretty broad spectral ranges. But the spectral resolution, um, resolving power is about 10 or even less than that. And so this brings us to the miniature X-ray solar spectrometer CubeSats to fill this need. And CubeSats are very useful to fill immediate needs that large scale satellite missions currently cannot fill, like the Reuven Ramati High Energy Solar Spectroscopic Imager, RESI which I'll talk about a little bit later also. So MINX fills this gap. It pushes our sensitivity to lower photon energies, and it actually has higher spectral resolution than these previous instruments. And there are two CubeSats, MINX1 and MINX2. And I worked on both of them as part of my PhD thesis. There's another instrument I'll talk about called DAX. But combined MINX and DAX has trained over 50 plus graduate students at the University of Colorado Boulder in a laboratory for atmospheric and space physics LASP, um, here I am with the MINX-1 CubeSat. As you see, it's pretty small. It's a three units CubeSat, which we'll highlight in a second. Um, here's Bennett Schwab, Robert Sewell. I helped work with them for the second generation of MINX CubeSats, MINX-3 technically. And this is the DAX instrument in the background. Um, James Mason worked with me on MINX-1 and other grad students here. 
Uh, there's Charlie Bolden. At the time, it was the uh, NASA administrator. So CubeSats are a great training tool for graduate students and postdocs. Science-oriented CubeSats are something that's fairly new in the past eight to 10 years. And so the first generation, MINX-1 and MINX-2, took observations of the sun from 2016 to 2019. It stands again for the miniature X-ray solar spectrometer CubeSat. Um, three U dimensions, so one unit is roughly a 10 centimeter cube. We stack these vertically to make MINX, <clears throat> which actually truly is a spacecraft. It has attitude determination and control systems to, so we know where we're pointing, has reaction wheels, torque rods to align ourselves to our, our target, the sun in this case, electrical power systems, which takes the radiant energy onto the solar panels, disperses this throughout the system, stores the residual energy in the battery. We also have command and data handling, which is the, basically the brains of the spacecraft. We also had ultra high frequency communication to telemetry data down to our ground station, which was essentially measuring tape, believe it or not. And I have a video if you all are interested in seeing this measuring tape test. We do have science instruments. So there is a spectrometer called X123, which was the main instrument, which is commercially purchased from AmpTech. It's a silicon drift dial detector, it's photon counting. We histogram all the photon events to create a spectrum. It had a nominal sensitivity from a half kV to 15 kV with a 0.03 kV bins, nominal spectral resolution of 0.2 kV. And I'll talk about how this has evolved over time with the 10 second integration. And some of the team members are here. The pre PI for it was Tom Woods. He was also one of my PhD advisors. I was the instrument scientist and Amir Caspi was the project scientist. I already mentioned James Mason, who's now at APL. These are our current affiliations here. But at the time of, this, of these years, 2016 to 2018, we were all at last, in Colorado, and then I went to the CFA after I graduated. So I have, we have a question in the audience. So it looks like usually like the spacecrafts are kind of more cube-like, and this is like very elongated. So yes. is there a reason why? So CubeSat started literally as cubes, and they just had, they were purposed for engineering tests. So attitude determination, propulsion, energy storage in space. And over time it's involved and they got larger and larger people stacked like four of these together or, or two. And then they said, hey, scientists said, hey, let's put some scientific instruments on board. And so first they were in situ measurements of Van Allen belts, so the magnetic field, particles in the magnetic field around earth. And we've evolved to radiative uh, diagnostics. So imaging sensors, spectrometers, et cetera. So is there a real reason? It's a common form factor that was the NASA and uh, trying to, Blue Canyon Technologies made our payload and a bus, but is there a real reason is vertical? I think it's just better for the deployer, which I'll show you in a second, because you can fit four of them in vertically. So there are, when we deployed, there were two spacecraft. It was us and one from the University of Michigan called Cadre. And you can actually, in a box, like rectangular shape, you can fit four. So I think that's the main reason, but they've evolved. So now there's 6U, which are two this way and three down. And then there are six, um, 12U, so two, two by two by three. And then they've, they've expanded. So there's not really, a, CubeSat is a misnomer now. It's not really, they're not really cubes anymore. They're rectangles, you know. <laughs> that's a good question. That's a, I've never had anyone ask that question, actually. So that's good. It's a five-year-old question. Sure. <laughs> Every question is good. Are there any other questions right now? Question in the back. Yeah. So how much of this is sort of off the shelf versus you can tell like, like it's, uh, some of the cubes are sort of just buy them, is that right? And some of them you have to pick up the parts, test them, or how does that work? So the bus is from Blue. Question, can you, can you repeat it for the so the question here is essentially, are all the parts custom or are all the parts off the shelf? Or is there a combination of them? Um, the majority of the spacecraft bus, EPS, command and data handling, solar panels, et cetera, are all COTS, commercial off the shelf. The payload here was from Blue Canyon Technologies, which were actually from aerospace grad students. They went and started their own company because they saw the wave coming of science-oriented CubeSats. And that's who we worked with. So they partnered with 
NASA and all the deployers. So essentially they have their own custom deployer with their own custom form factor CubeSats. So they basically have a monopoly somewhat in the business, which is actually really smart. So that's mostly COTS. The scientific instruments, it depends. Most of the time they're COTS. There are some custom technology development aspects, maybe like ratings or a new detector or some filters combinations. That could be custom. If you go on like websites, they'll tell you somewhere between one and three million, depending on the unit size. This 3U publicly is about one to two million. But all I'll say is that we had labor that wasn't directly billed. So the cost is higher than that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Are there other questions? So we that's a great question. So myself, other grad students, a few undergrads and some postdocs worked the majority of the time in labor on it. But we also had effort from engineers. And as you, some of you know, they're not they're not cheap. So those hours weren't directly built to the project, you know. They were helping out education. <laughs> And so the first version of Minx was launched from Kennedy Space Center in 2015 and then deployed from the International Space Station to its nominal orbit of roughly 350 kilometers from the International Space Station in 2016. And this deployment happened at 3 a.m. in Boulder time. So we were all sitting down at our command center in Boulder. And as you know, in space, they just orbit 90 minutes. So they don't really care what time of the day it is on the ground. They just, they're exe the astronauts are executing their mission. And so I was watching this at 3 a.m., half sleep, you know, kind of sleep deprived. And I watched this and I said, oh no, it's gonna crash. And I thought my physics brain said, oh no, it's gonna orbit. Everything's good, don't have to worry about it. But the actual, like the viewpoint, the vantage point, it looked like it was just going straight down. <laughs> well, we actually would deploy it back in a way. So it's actually really cool to see. And I'm amazed every time I watch this. So now we'll start talking about some of the science. And if you all are interested in more detailed instrumentation, testing, mission operations, et cetera, that's another talk that I can give at another time. But there is a lot that went into all of that. So we're just going to fast forward and say, hey, we have some data. <laughs> Let's look at the data. So current Minx and DAX solar CubeSat science. We'll start on the left with quiescent sun thermal emission. And so CubeSats themselves, they can fill a bit niche, but by themselves, they can't do a lot of science. You're just too limited with the instrumentation and the form factor. But you can combine them strategically with large so, uh, other observatories, not necessarily solar observatories, and you can, you can do some pretty good science. So Minx had almost simultaneous observations with NUSTAR. I don't know if you all are familiar with that satellite. It measures X-rays and even some gamma rays of black holes and neutron stars, but every now and then it points at the sun. And it can only point at the sun when there is not much solar flux or else the dead time on the detector is so high, it basically paralyzes it for the, effectively speaking. And so there were some times where the sun steps off X-ray emission was not very intense and new star pointed at it. And we almost always pointed at the sun with minks in our 90 minute orbit when we were not eclipsed. And so here are some pointings that happened that were directed by our colleague, Ian Hanna at Glasgow. Uh, the blue data is the new star spectra. This spectral resolution is not very great. If you noticed from before, you saw all those lines in the synthetic spectra. This is what happens when you don't have high spectral resolution. You get us the line. <laughs> That's the Bremsstrahlung dominating. And Minx, um, again, it's a CubeSat. Uh, so there's decent spectral resolution. We'll talk about DAX, which has much better spectral resolution in a second. We perform spectral fits, um, isothermals, and they're fairly close. And these are non um, I don't want to say calibrated, but cross calibrated instruments, even without the cross calibration occurring, the fact that the photon flux is pretty much in line is, is really good, actually. So this results from that will be coming out in a paper that I'll be publishing soon. So that's a quick view of quiescent sun data. So now we'll talk about active region, solar flares, elemental abundance variations. We'll also talk a, a little bit about plasma energetics. Um, I have a few papers about plasma energetics. There's a grad student that we're working with on plasma energetics. I'll briefly mention the details of that, but I won't go into much detail about it today. That's again, that's a whole nother talk that I could have just on the energetics of solar flares. 
so sorry. Let's go back to this. So what we see here are not soft X-ray images, unfortunately, but just to show you how cool solar flares are. These are extreme ultraviolet images from the Solar Dynamics Observatory. They're composites. So we're looking at 500,000 degree plasma, cooler plasma about 100,000 degrees to 50,000 degrees in the dark red that was just jettisoned out and coming down. We have plasma that's about two mega Kelvin here, these loops. And you can see actually see spicules in the chromosphere of the sun. And you can definitely tell the sun is magnetized, right? As you watch the plasma flow down, you'll see it divert its path and follow particular paths. And that's driven by the magnetic field orientation. And this is so cool, in my opinion, I'll play it again. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah, so these are composite images. It's a different filter images and they've been co-aligned. They're simultaneous because they, they, the filters are from different telescopes on the same observatory called Solar Dynamics Observatory. The instrument is called Atmospheric Imaging Assembly AIA. And it takes data about roughly every 12 seconds. And this has been highly processed. Um, the image credit, the video credit was in the beginning. And this is about an hour. Most flares, it depends on their size. They can be anywhere from five minutes to even three or four hours. But this was a moderate size flare. And it was about an hour. It does. And again, this is just the sun. This isn't even other stars. <laughs> so I think the sun is a cool star. Right? So the miniature X-ray spectrometer took measurements from relatively low solar fluxes, quiescent sun, which is the blue here. So times where the solar emission during a solar flare was three orders of magnitude greater in soft X-rays as the black line here. And so we here we have an iron 24 and 25 feature. There's a little nickel hump here, calcium, argon, silicon, sulfur, magnesium. So there's the humps in count flux space. And this is a video NASA made for us when our CubeSat. So MIX was the first science-oriented CubeSat funded by the NASA Science Mission Directorate. And they also made this nice video for us, one of the small flares, to see our flux change. So that's pretty cool. But what's even better is, again, we can compare MINX and these semi simultaneous observations with other large satellites. So again, RESI, Ruben Ramansi High Energy Solar Spectroscopic Imager, uh, Brian Dennis, and this guy is about 80 years old. And he was my uh, mentor when I was an intern at NASA Goddard about 12 years ago. And he worked with us to analyze the data for RESI and process it here. And so here's a cartoon indicating some of the basics of what happens in the solar flare after the magnetic fields rearrange, magnetic reconnection occurs, the field lines are adjusted, particles are accelerated out into space. Sometimes there's a coronal mass ejection where the plasma is jettisoned out to space. Sometimes the plasma actually just sits and subtended above the reconnection region and radiatively cools and eventually flows back down. But what we care about for this analysis are the particles accelerated back into the solar atmosphere electrons and protons, which makes microwaves, but when they interact with the denser plasma in the bottom of the corona and in the chromosphere, bremsstrahlung, non-thermal bremsstrahlung occurs. Non-thermal because the energy of the initial electrons was not driven by the plasma temperature. But there's also thermal bremsstrahlung, which we see with the Minx CubeSat. And these are simultaneous observations. And in photon flux, they fit fairly well. So we've performed spectral fits on this. We've done energetics on this. Some of that's in more at all 2018. There's another additional paper by Amir Caspi working on this. And there's a third paper that I'll have coming out talking about this. The soft X-rays come from the plasma filling the loop, cooling radiatively where it's more dense. And eventually the plasma cools such that it radiates in extreme ultraviolet. And that's what you're seeing in those EUV images. So if we also had cold spatial, cold temporal X-ray images, you would see those light up first, then the EUV, then the UV, and then some of the visible light. So a graduate student that works with uh, me, Chriselle Suarez, she's at Vanderbilt, but she works with us through the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory Postdoc Predoctoral Program. 
She's analyzed rough t roughly 20 flares that Minx has observed, and she's basically histogrammed with two temperature fits, the average amount of plasma along the line of sight radiating, which we call the emission measure, and the temperatures. And they range from four to 18. And these are small flares. Um, this is nomenclature that we use, but these are me smaller to medium-sized flares to medium-sized flares. So the M size flares are the ones you saw in that video from the EUV data. That looks really, really cool. So a summary, basically, uh, we could look at the first ionization potential and for the elements that have a low FIP, less than 10 EV, iron, magnesium, silicon, nickel, calcium, we can fit elemental abundances and look at mid and high FIP. But essentially the summary here for non-flaring times, the amount of these elements compared to the photosphere is about a factor of two. And the amount in during flaring times compared to the photosphere is about the same. Um, there's physics behind why we think that ha happens, partly due to pressure differentials of the influx of particles into the chromosphere region, and sometimes precipitating all of the way down to the higher photosphere, which causes plasma to flow back up into the corona because the pressure is lower up here. It's called chromospheric evaporation. It's a fancy term. But that's being seen during flares. So deviations in the amount of these lower first ionization potential elements and 15 to 20 megakelvin for the largest flares. So MINX1 did a, and MINX2, they obtained a lot of data, was really good. The spectral resolution was pretty good, not great. But again, we had a broader spectral range than previously measured. We had higher spectral resolution for that broad range than previously measured. It was all spatially integrated spectra, which is okay but it's better than what was previously up in space. And so for 2017, 2018, myself and others worked with Benish Schwab who received his PhD on DAX and Robert Sewell who worked on his master's program with DAX, which flew on a rocket, sounding rocket. And now it's currently taking observations on a CubeSat that launched this year through a consortium with India, Taiwan, the US and a few other countries called DAX. And why is it called DAX? Because there's dual apertures Tungsten to attenuate majority of X-rays, Kapton, which attenuates the lower energy X-rays and lets the higher energy X-rays transmit through and go through a beryllium filter, which transmits, mo which blocks most of the visible light and transmits the other X-rays. This allows for us to have a higher sensitivity at the higher energies. As you see this distribution due to the exponential from the Bremsstrahlung, we typically get much, much lower flux at the higher energies, but now we have more sensitivity here. But in addition to that, there's been changes with the internal electronics the capacitance, the peaking times, et cetera. So we have higher spectral resolution, that's the point. So we get more humps. And this is the rocket and the actual observations on orbit currently are even better spectral resolution than this, as you can see features here, especially during flaring times. Now I won't show that yet because it's not published, but that's a future talk. And the point here with this table in the bottom is that one can do improved estimates of the elemental abundance deviations for magnesium, silicon, sulfur, and iron. So we had a question in the back. I'm just curious what the end of the life of a CubeSat is like. Is it just they run out of recyclables and then it just floats forever? Does it eventually come back and burn up in the atmosphere or what's the end of that? So it varies. And I don't remember the latest statistics on this. Uh, when I was in grad school, something like 50% of CubeSats, you just don't hear from again. Yeah. So mix one, we heard from again. And we, our plan, you have to have a plan, is when you deorbit, you can't have material so dense and so much of it that it will make it all the way back to Earth. So it has it basically disintegrate in the atmosphere. And so we, that was the plan for MIGS-1. It deorbited, um, basically the drag from all the particles because we did not have any thrust. So we just gradually deorbited and eventually it burned up and we didn't hear anything from it again. We had a one year um, mission lifetime. So that was good, that was planned. MIGS-2, we went to a higher orbit, 500 kilometers, polar orbit, sun synchronous. Uh, we, and I wasn't there for this, <laughs> we had a command sent. It put the spacecraft in a state it should not have been in. And then we had a pulse, uh, we had a, a power surge. And we believe it was put in an orientation such that we couldn't communicate with it. So for the, so for example, with MIGS-1 and you saw the measuring tape, it radiates, you know, transverse to that. So if you're on this axis, you're not gonna get much. So with the tip, what typically happens is we just roll, we just tumble. And that tumbling, eventually you get communication with the spacecraft again. We think we got put in the state where we were basically aligned such that we had a null 
and we basically, and with the power surge, we had some damage to the circuitry, which we did get that data down, so we saw that. But after about four months, we didn't hear anything else back from Mixu. So we fit the 50%, right? One worked well, finished the end of mission. The second one took data, but then, and interesting enough, when I showed you the deployment from the ISS, there were two CubeSats. One was Minx and one was another CubeSat, which I won't mention the university, but there's, they never heard anything from theirs. So that's that 50% rule again. It's like, it just works. So DAX so far is working. <laughs> so that's great. So probably the fourth CubeSat won't work, right? <laughs> that's, that's the odds, that's how it goes, right? Yeah, about 4KV, uh, you're talking about, is that noise or the speed? It's a, there is flux here, but the sensitivity for that integration time is not high enough. So it, that's why it looks like that. There's flux there, but we can't constrain it that well. So the uncertainties get large. But for our observations, we actually have flux measured down to six KEV for the CubeSat version of this instrument. Cause the integration, you can just stack a bunch of spectra for like an hour. And again, I'm not gonna show that cause it's not published yet, but we will show it in the future. Give it us about six months to a year. Are there other questions? Convert, this, is an hour? this is five minute rocket flight. So these sounding rockets, they, this one was launched from White Sands missile range. And it's a, basically a parabolic trajectory. You go up probably 250 kilometers. It depends on the weight of the payload and the boosters and everything. But then you come down, you point, you point at the sun in our situation for about five minutes. There's a 15 minute time when you actually could take some science data, but the, there's too much noise, there's too much for our soft x-rays, there's too much absorption by the solar the Earth's atmosphere. So there's only really five minutes where you have high quality science data. And these sounding rockets happen all the time. There's other x-ray instruments that launch them. I'll talk about another one towards the end of this talk. There's astrophysics, um, sounding rockets that happen at night. I could show you guys in the future talk a video. We have video because we have cameras on board and you see the whole flight. It's really cool. Any other questions? All right, so solar flare loop modeling, and then we'll be wrapping up the science. So we have a grant working with colleague Jeffrey Reap at Naval Research Laboratory to perform numerical modeling based upon EUV observations of ribbons that we see in flares. This is what I mentioned before as the plasma cools, you start seeing it in the EUV after it's already emitted in the soft x-rays and microwaves. And the plasma is falling down, relatively cooling, and it goes through different ionization, as the plasma changes different ionization states of iron, actually, you see it emitting at different lower and lower temperatures later and later and later in the flare. But while the magnetic fields are reconnecting, this RK structure builds and reconnection is believed to occur higher and higher and higher up. We have indirect evidence of this. We don't have in-situ measurements yet, possibly in the near future, maybe one day, hopefully. But the model is basically using successive reconnection so it's just driving the plasma effects. So we use a hydrodynamic model to calculate what's the pressure, temperature, density, plasma flows, et cetera, and then the subsequent radiation. So that's what Jeffrey does. And his model <clears throat> currently creates, recreates the geostationary operational environmental satellites X-ray signal, which is spatially integrated and spectrally integrated in the soft X-ray. So those little, um, the color here, I believe is red, as each individual little loop. And many of these loops reconnect and they are successive, successively higher and higher in altitude. And that composites or aggregate signal matches the other curve, which is what is actually observed. So we said, hey, let's try this and compare it with other observations. He's compared with AIA, which I showed you earlier. He's compared with XRT that we're comparing here with Minx. This is one of our earlier estimates and this is published in Repo all 2020. We have newer ones which fit better than this. I just didn't have time to put that video in here. But essentially, um, the red line is the model, the black are Minx spectral observations in the right-hand side of the spectra, which fit decently. And the time series is here on the left. Um, there are a lot of curves. The pink and the purple are just different X-ray channels from GOES. The triangles are our X-ray photometer, which is similar to the GOES photometers. And the circles are our spectrum integrated across a certain band pass. And this matched fairly well temporally and spectrally, they're pretty good matches. So this is a start. So we have a grant for this. Chriselle Suarez is working on this for her dissertation in terms of approving the model itself. 
improving the hydrodynamic simulations, working with some magnetic models for better starting parameters. So we have, we'll have a few papers coming out soon that she'll be in charge of. So that's the past. That's what we've done. And again, that was spatially integrated, spectrally resolved over a fairly broad spectral band pass. But as I said before, and the question that we had earlier was for these images, um, are they spectrally resolved? And the answer was not really. They kind of are, but they're not. So the future is really to focus on spatial solar soft X-ray spectra. So here's an example of a grazing incidence telescope called Water one parabolic primary, hyperbolic secondary. So what we have in the pipeline now is future solar X-ray imagers. Saxe rocket, which is funded um, for a launch riding along the high C, which is another instrument. It's a high space. High C is a spatial, high spatial resolution coronal imager in the EUV. And that's this bigger orange tube. But this smaller tube is our, basically this thing here. So we have grazing incidence, small size optics. There's a baffle here. It puts this down to a high speed readout sensor with back end electronics. And Sofia Sanchez Meas, she's a PhD student at Harvard. I'm a PhD advisor. She's working on this for her dissertation, testing, integration, operations, et cetera. And we have a whole host of colleagues that work with us at Smithsonian, at Harvard, and at Marshall Space Flight Center for the optics. So we want to fly this. We're going to launch it. It's going to look at a, flight, a flare. After we prove that this works, we're going to make some improvements and then propose for a small sat called SACSI. SACSI in here is the Swift Solar Activity X-ray Imager. Here's just a small sat solar activity X-ray imager. We're designing this for a launch in solar minimum, which happens in 2028. And I'll tell you briefly about why we want solar minimum. So for the rockets, we're gonna look at a flare. And current CCD saturate and bloom during large and medium to large size solar flares. We see that here, it's apparent in the extreme ultraviolet. This is AIA again, but it blows out everything here in the X-rays. The contrast, as you saw earlier, is greater because remember, as we get to higher and higher temperature plasma, the amount of emission you get is much, much orders of magnitude greater than a lower temperature plasma. So when a flare happens, plasma heats up very quickly, and that causes a huge increase in the soft X-ray flux. And this causes blooming and saturation in the pixels. So we lose a lot of information. So the detector that we have is going to mitigate that by its intrinsic electronic architecture, in addition to how fast it reads out. And so that's going to help mitigate this. And current observations of what we call quasi periodic pulsations. This is our science objective. So these are oscillations that occur and they're very faint, small in terms of the magnitude. So what you see here in the top are, again, the, those goals, spatially integrated, spectrally integrated soft X-ray time series. But if you actually do a detrending of the general trend, you see these deviations and they're pretty small. And we see this in, EUV, we see it in the microwaves, we see it in the x-rays, we see it in the hard x-rays. So what's driving these oscillations, these quasi-periodic pulsations? We believe it's due to energy release in the flare. Is it intermittent particle acceleration into the atmosphere causing these oscillations? Is it trapped particles mirroring back and forth locally? Is it that magnetic field itself oscillating? So we have models to constrain this. Um, Jeff Reap and others are working on these models. Laura Hayes is the expert in terms of the data analysis of these QPPs. She's on our team for this sounding rocket opportunity. So we'll try to investigate that in 2024, 2025. So the last section of this talk is talking about after we launch this rocket, prove that the technology of the instrumentation works, we'll make some improvements and then we'll modify the instrument so that we can look at the very, very dim sun when flares are not readily occurring, when there aren't many active regions on the disk. We want to conduct continuous full sun, spatially resolved spectral images. We want to perform a statistical survey of transient events. These are very, very tiny events that new star sees. Um, Rusty has seen them also, and other older images have seen them. We also want to look at the active regions, how they evolve over time, and variations in the quiet sun, primarily to bridge the relationship between micro flaring and this term here called nanoflares, which is a very contentious term in the solar physics community. But this is the bridge region we want in terms of thermal energy space. Typical flares that you saw were around 10 to the 30 to 10 to the 32 ergs for the total duration of the flare. Micro flares are roughly 10 to the six, lower than that, roughly I said. Um, it's a sloppy language that we use in our field. 
but nano is really down here at 10 to the 26 and even lower. But we're trying to bridge down to nano because these are previous observations from Han et al. 2011. Soft X-rays are here and hard X-rays and they basically roll over. So they did not have enough sensitivity to see the dimmest plasma during quiescent times. We do, we actually specifically designed this instrument so that we can. So this is our goal. Continuous measurements, HPD, hot power diameter, which is basically spatial resolutions, not the best, but we're improving that. Um, spectral resolution is greater, much better, up to 40 resolving power from 0.6 to 6 keV. And these are some other parameters here. Uh, Kathy Reeves is working with myself on some of the science goals at SAO, at the Center for Astrophysics. And here's a prediction that I made using those model parameters that we set up. And what you see here with the red, the green, and the blue dots are the spectra at these spatial locations. And this is actually an observation. Um, there's something called differential emission measure that I calculated based upon actual observations and then forward modeled the photon flux into our instrument to see what we would likely observe. And this is static, and this is just showing some of the features we could detect, calculating elemental abundances, temperatures, and we can also confine the heating mechanisms. So remember, before I talked about alpha and wave dissipation, I talked about nano flares. We can actually address certain aspects of those distributions. Um, how prevalent is alpha and wave or heating occurring as a function of position and age of active regions or in regions where there aren't active regions as a function of the solar cycle? And also, how often are these little transients occurring as we go down and down and down to lower and lower energies? So basically constr helping constrain how often alpha and waves contribute and nano flares contribute as a function of time and spatial position and feature on the sun. So I know that was a lot. I tried to just focus on the science and I hope you enjoyed this talk and I appreciate you all for letting me come out and give you a presentation about soft X-ray probes of hot plasma in the atmosphere of a cool star. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We had a lot of questions during the talk, but are there more uh, questions now? Thank you, Chris. That was an interesting, um, an exciting talk. Um, so the question, when um, you showed the loop, um, reconnection loop fitting into the soft x-rays, you saw variability on the order of an hour. Uh, how do you account for this temporal variability when you integrate in stack images over an hour? So which, which slide do you want me to go to? Yeah, just go back a bit and I'll, um, I'll recognize it when I see it. One more? Yeah. This one? This one, that's right. So you, you see the variation on 3,000 seconds, right? And then if you go back one side prior to this, go back, uh, one more. Here you go. Yeah. So um, if you, you know, this is over five minutes. If you stack this image over an hour, how do you account for the differences in, you know, repeat images um, when you integrate versus the temporal actual physical variability? That's a great question. So these are spe spatially integrated. Um, it's very difficult for to extract out where is this emission coming from? One way to do that is we're, we're fortunate. And if you watch this video, the sun rotates and these dominant features, this, these are active regions here. One way, which is not the best way, but it's, it's highly limited, is to take measurements when there aren't many active regions present, and then literally they rotate on the disk, and you can look at a difference image or spectra. That gives some constraint, but that's even assuming the sun is static, there's basically, which is not. We know it's not. So that's a very important question to ask. Um, that's one way, which is not the best way. A second way is use a combination of the X-ray image, images that I showed earlier that were filter, filter integrated and cross calibrate that with the spectrum. I'm actually working on that now. And Sofia sanchez Mayas is also working with me on that to try to disentangle um, the spatial features and how they contribute to the spectrum. Um, the third way is what we're proposing now, which I think is the easiest. This is literally take images, the spectral images. So then you can, separate that out directly. Now, your question is more about the temporal aspect. Um, basically, you have very sensitive images, uh, sensors and detectors 
So telescopes with big collecting, large collecting area, sensors that can read out fairly fast. There's not really a direct way besides directly measuring the differences and you just need better instrumentation. That's why I actually stick with the instrumentation as my focus after grad school, because I, I worked on simulations, I did data analysis, I did technology development and instrumentation, but you can only do so much with the data. It's just best to get better instruments. Now, the problem is that takes time, takes money, you have to get more missions, but I think that's the best way to go about it in the long run. Okay. So Johanna Teske from our Earth and Planets Laboratory um, had a question. So the, is it SACSI? Is that how you pronounce the mission? Or, um, SACSI, yes. Yeah. Um, so what's the time scale? When will it start and how long will it last? Is it SACSI rocket or SACSI small sat? This, well, I guess the small, the small sat. The small sat we're proposing for 2028 and we would like a five-year mission that could be accomplished with sun synchronous 500 kilometer orbit that's polar. Mm -hmm. Um, Hanodi actually telescope has that our minx cubesat had second cubesat had that and dax has that also on inspire sat and then what dictates the um, band pass like i mean pr presumably you'd like to go above 6 kv so you could see like the iron line right at 6.7 but what what's setting your band pass for these things the filters the reflectivities of the optics we can we can tailor it to go to higher energies that's partly limited by the depletion depth or the active region of the silicon-based detector. Mm -hmm. um, our detector's thicknesses, it loses detection efficiency as you go above 10 keV. So in theory, we could probably get to 8 keV, but we'd have to sacrifice some of the lower energy band pass. And that's primarily because the way we're operating, if we perform measurements like these here, mm -hmm. we, we're doing photon counting, so that's dependent upon the flux from the sun and the readout rate of the sensors. If we read, if too many photons come in before we can read out, then we have pile up occurring. So two photons come in and the energy yeah. summed in that event is placed at twice the yeah. sum of the energies. So it's a trade off between all those things. Now, I think personally, because there's an instrument called Foxy, it's flown on rockets and eventually I think it'll go on a mission. That has sensitivity down to about 4 keV and that goes up to about 40 or 50 keV. I think it's best because their optics are designed for high energy photons to image high energy photons. I think it's best if Foxy focuses on 4 to 40 keV and we focus between 5 and 6 down to about a half keV. That's just my preference. I think we could work together on that. And then two more quick questions. So will that be during a solar minimum or how does that align? With so that? this is another thing. Foxy wants to go during solar maximum. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But for our science objectives, we prefer to go during solar minimal. Yeah. Okay. And then um, Alicia Weinberger, also from EPL, she was wondering about the flare loop modeling, which, so is there also predictions for microwave emission that we, we would also have coincident with the X-ray emission for these, you know, the, the particles coming back down? I'd have to ask Jeffrey Reap about that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he can create some uh, synthetic microwave emissions. Yeah. But I, yeah. don't, I don't know if he's done that already. Yeah, it'd be but interesting he, for a more complete picture, maybe. Yes, he's already expanded it to visible light. So he has visible light, UV, EUV, soft x-rays. And I'm pretty sure he can do it for microwaves. Cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for the questions online. Are there any last questions? Thanks. So it at the very beginning, I think you mentioned that like the heat dissipation is one of the big questions. And so I was wondering if um, all of the lines, the metal lines that you're detecting and, and modeling, like have we, or have you learned like constrained this process at all like with this new data? And... So one diagnostic is the actual elemental abundance um, because flares, we've seen what's called chromospheric evaporation where the pressure differential drives plasma that's lower down up into the atmosphere, which radiates in soft x-rays. And then you go from seeing a certain amount of iron, silicon, magnesium, calcium, and that diminishes when that happens. That we would think would persist with smaller nano flares. And so Newstar and Foxy believe that they've seen evidence that some of this particle acceleration for smaller flares still occurs. Like the physics is different, but the scale can be smaller. 
if that's the case, then we could better say that a flaring like process is occurring at these spatial locations versus predominantly an alpha wave energy contribution process. Mm -hmm. um, we'd expect the abundances to be similar and not deviate much if alpha and waves were dominating. Now, in addition to that, there are some other radiative signatures that I'm not 100% sure about to, to speak about on this platform. I can talk with you offline about sure. some of those, but there are, there should be multiple. We can also look at just the temporal fluctuations. If you can measure very fast, I'm talking about sub-seconds. Um, there's belief that you should be, able, should be able to see a certain type of temporal signature that can distinguish between alpha and wave and nanoclear mm -hmm. heating for a, a specific spatial location, like very small spatial mm -hmm. locations. So that's, that's years down the line though, because you need very fine spatial resolution mm -hmm. and very quick timing. Right. I think that's 20 years down the line okay. for an instrument to do that. Okay. It's good to have a roadmap. It is, yeah. it is. Thanks. All right, I think we're about out of time. So let's thank Chris again for a great talk. And if anyone wants to join for dinner, we're planning to go to the Green Street restaurant. So just send me an email.